Hello and welcome back to Guillotine, the 18th century chemist theater. Today we are going to continue on with stoichiometry, talking about a slightly more complex scenario. In the last scenario, we, we talked about having one uh, compound's information and then figuring everything else out. Uh, but what makes things a little different for the idea of a limiting reactant is that you'll be given the information for at least two reactants. Um, knowing that one of them will probably run out first. And so the math isn't all that different. Conceptually, it's not all that challenging to figure out what the limiting reactant is, especially if you build off the framework that we already established last time. So let's dive right in and talk about the idea of stuff running out. For instance, let's say you were going to make some lemonade. Well, uh, your lemonade might be limited by how much sugar you have. You know, if you only have one cup of sugar, there's only so much lemonade that you can theoretically make. And that's the whole point of limiting reactants. If you have a log and you're burning a log, typically the wood runs out long before the oxygen does. But if you can cut down the oxygen, uh, then the fire would stop. And this happens all the time. Think about making a sandwich. You might have two pieces of bread and a whole jar of peanut butter. Well, you still can only make one sandwich because you only got two pieces of bread. And so life's not perfect, things run out, and this is how you deal with these things in chemistry. Um, these, are, these are very easy to identify because what they have to do is give you information about more than one reactant. And so in this, in this scenario, you're going to have something that runs out first, and that's called the limiting reactant, and you're going to have some, or reagent, and then you're going to have something that, or many things that are left over, and those are called the excess reactant reagents. You can end up with a stoichiometric perfect amount of all reactants, so nothing is left over. And that might be a goal of yours, especially if you don't want waste. But in the real world, you know, you're going to run out of something probably. When you burn something, when you react something, something's going to run out and there's going to be other stuff left. And so um, how do we do it? How do we determine what a limiting reactant is? Okay, well, the first thing to do is realize that you have a limiting reactant problem. And that's easy to identify because, again, they're going to give you information about more than one reactant. Um, and then you can limit from there. In a typical stoichiometry problem, you'd only give you one thing, and you would just assume that you had enough of everything else. And so there are many ways to figure out what your limiting reactants is. Uh, the technique I like to use is that I like to solve for a common product. Always solve, you know, even if there's more than one product, pick out one product and have all of the reactants solve for that same product. Uh, because then what you have is a very clear apples to apples comparison. Whichever of those produces the least amount of product is by default the limiting reactant. And the nice thing about doing it this way is you sort of kill two birds with one stone because not only do you figure out what the limiting reactant is, uh, but you automatically start figuring out how much product is produced. So that saves you a little bit of time in the long run. Now if all you have to do is figure out what the limiting reactant is, then there are simpler ways to do it and I'll show you a couple ways. But I found this is the least confusing method for students, is to solve for a common product, apples to apples, and see which of your reactants makes the least of that product. All right, And then once you figure out what limits you, then you, uh, you, you pretend that there is enough of everything else and just continue your stoichiometry as normal. And a pizzeria is a great example of this. And so imagine, again, that you're working at a pizza store. Um, if I just said, you know, in another example, I said, hey, you have five pizza dough balls. How many pizzas can you make? You'd say five because you'd assume that you'd have enough of everything else. But if I said, okay, well, you have five pizza dough balls and three cups of sauce, how many pizzas can you make? Well, now you have to figure out, well, which one of those is going to run out first? Uh, you know, you might have an ocean of pizza sauce in the back room, but if you only have five pizza dough balls, it doesn't matter. You have enough pizza sauce to make five pizzas. And so the ingredient that limits you is going to be hence called the limiting reactant. Like, for example, in the case of soil and plant growth, often what limits a plant's growth is the nutrient nitrogen in the soil. And that's why we created artificial fertilizers. Uh, without, without the Fritz, Fritz Haber and his Haber process of taking nitrogen out of the air and fixing it into a usable form, um, then, then we would never be able to support 7 billion plus people on the planet because the nitrogen runs out in the soil first and that prevents plant growth. And so the same thing works for all chemical reactions, or pizza if you like to think of it that case. Of course you could just make pizza without anchovies. So let's, let's deal with this. Uh, I have 100 grams of each reactant for the combustion of hydrogen. Um, what limits and how many grams of water will be produced. Now remember, you do not have to start off 
a limiting reactant problem with equal masses of each reactant. It's, it's very unnecessary. You could have 10 grams of one and 1,000 tons of another one. Um, but, you know, for the sake of, of simplicity, let's pretend we had the same amount of each reactant, which certainly isn't necessary. But um, So here's everything I need. Uh, so writing on relevant information is always important. I have 100 grams of hydrogen diatomic, 100 grams of oxygen diatomic. I'm, I'm going to need to figure out the mass of of water produced, and hence I'm going to need all the molar masses here. So I need a balanced equation, so we'll go ahead and balance this, because remember like all stoichiometry problems, I'll, I'll need this for the mole-mole ratio, and then I need the relevant molar masses. I'm not going to show any work for this. Uh, your teacher may or may not want you to show work for this stuff. I certainly would for anything more complex than a diatomic. So now I have everything set up. I've got uh, what I'm going to start with and what I'm going to solve for. And again, the big difference between this and a classic stoichiometry problem is in classic stoichiometry, you're given one amount and then you feed to everything else. But in this case, you're given multiple amounts and you feed to a common product and see which makes the, the least of that common product. So let's start with the hydrogen gas. You can start with either one. So I'm going to turn that into moles of hydrogen and then moles of water. Now, if all they wanted us to do was figure out what the limiting reactant was, you could stop right there and compare moles of water to moles of water. But I'd like to take the final step and figure out how many grams of water gets produced. They asked us for that, and you know it's probably something you're going to be asked to do anyway. And so we plug in the numbers. We plug in the appropriate mass, the numbers from the mole-mole ratio. Those are the coefficients, and then the molar mass again. Estimate. Always estimate. So we've got 2 over 2 cancels out. 18 over 2, that ends up being uh, about 9, and 9 times... Uh, 100 is going to be, uh, in this case, 892. Um, I limited myself to three sig figs since I only had three sig figs for the molar mass of diatomic hydrogen. But you could certainly take more numbers off the periodic table if you want to. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing with oxygen, and I'm going to feed to the same exact product, which is easy to do in this case because we only have one product. But in many cases, you'll produce more than one product, and it's absolutely critical that you solve for the same product. Otherwise, you're comparing apples and oranges, and you don't really know what runs out. So in this case, I've got uh, uh, 2 times 18, which is about 36, 36 over 32, which means it's going to be a little higher. So what are we going to do with about 110 grams, 112.6 grams of water? So in this case, it's very, very obvious that I'm going to be able to produce much more water with 100 grams of hydrogen than 100 grams of oxygen. 100 grams of oxygen can produce about 112 grams of water, and 100 grams of hydrogen can produce 900 grams, which makes sense because you're going to have a lot more moles of diatomic hydrogen than you would diatomic oxygen with 100 grams. And so really, we totally ignore now um, hydrogen gas we had enough hydrogen gas. So the 892 is a fantasy number. It never really exists in the real world. What really happens is that oxygen reacts with hydrogen gas. Oxygen runs out first, and then it limits us to 112 grams of water. So you can completely ignore the, the how much hydrogen gas we actually had. All right, And there's some neat things you can do with that. Um, you, you can Once you figure out how many grams of hydrogen of water is produced, um, you can figure out how many grams of hydrogen got consumed, and you can play with the numbers and law of conservation of mass. I may throw another lesson up showing some of the advanced things you can do to you know, uh, dig a little deeper in what this all means. But uh, this is a very simple technique. It works all the time, and uh, that will teach you how to do limiting reactants. All right. So feel free to explore the internet. There's definitely a lot of other people who have a lot of other opinions how to solve it. But the reason I like that is because it builds off what you already know how to do. So why carry around two tools in the bag when you only have to carry around one? And so uh, with that uh, truth is uh, under your belt, <laughs> uh, that's all we're going to have for today. Thanks for watching and have a great day.